This state was never a place that was on my bucket list for a thousand mile off-road trip with my friends. But now that I've done it, I can't believe more people aren't talking about Nevada. And there's plenty here that looks exactly how you'd envision it, but there's so much more that is not at all like what I expected. This is the Power Stop Trip. What do you, uh, where's the... It's, you just turn this guy. And, uh, okay. yeah, so. The dream is to make it from Canada to Mexico, mostly off-road. The first year we did all of Washington, which was just under 600 miles. The second year we did Oregon, which was like 700, somewhere in there. This year is almost a thousand. Nevada is a giant chunk of this overall trip that we have of trying to make it to the Mexican border. Kelly and I are starting this year's trip where we ended last year's in Neo here in Nevada. And we're gonna meet the rest of the guys that are from Texas and Chicago down in Elko. Our routes through each state are based on the backcountry discovery routes. And then we just kind of tailor them a little bit based on what the conditions are, if something's on fire or whatever, we figure out a way around it. Uh-oh, that's not where the transmission's located. You can't film this. <laughs> My name is David Oliver. Uh, I'm the owner of Willamette Motor and Fabrication in uh, Dallas, Texas. And uh, this year I brought back the Suburban and uh, brought a new co-driver in David Des Moines. So as the crow flies from this point right here to the yeah, Overland been... Pass, which is the end of the, uh, the funnel, by, not bypass, the option route we're going to take, is like 69 yeah. miles. And then as we zigzag across it, no. I guesstimate it's between 80 and 95 miles of trail. Last year, Chris rode shotgun in Suburban whenever we did the Oregon route, but this year he brought his Raptor and he's going to be our navigator for the trip. And we got a lot of catching up to do tonight. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. If we can run through everyone's rig, I'll catch up by the campfire tonight, make it an easy early day. Um, Don't say that. Once we sort out these issues. I'm just, I'm trying the to. easy early day. I'm trying to while purposely we sort out issues. Dish, <laughs> like, just tank our chances just by saying, oh, this is going to be such an easy trip. <laughs> yeah. like, it's be perfect weather, no <laughs> bed bugs. <laughs> no bed bugs. <laughs> Specifically no bed bugs. Specifically. <laughs> That's a lot of trash. Yeah, what a shame. Public land, not a public toilet. That looks like, that looks like a lot of it's been here for a long time. To be honest, we're at the wrong time of year to be here. Like, if you're gonna come do this, you should do it probably like spring or fall. Every year it gets earlier, now that I'm thinking about it. It was, we did it in June when we were in Washington. We did it in May, I believe, whenever we uh, did the one in Oregon. I have a feeling we are going to see a ton of mud. And by the looks of the mountains, if we get up there at all, uh, we're gonna see plenty of snow. If I'm reading the clouds up on the mountains in front of us correctly, it appears to be dumping snow at altitude, and I would guess that it's doing it on almost every mountain range that is close by. On these bigger trips, the first day is always kind of a burner day. We're all excited to like see each other again. A lot of us don't ne live near each other, so we stay up too late, we drink a little too much, we laugh a little too loud. But Kelly gave us some information of something going on with his truck that uh, put a big damper on the party. So I noticed uh, a little bit of a leak and in my mind, I was like, oh, no big deal, not a leak. But then I remember on these four nine inches, when they start leaking, the reason they leak is because the wheel bearings are bad. Yeah. So for peace of mind, I just jacked it up. Uh -huh. And the left side is, you can pull on it, it flops around. Oh, and yeah. when I spin it, you can hear it, you know, the bearing kind of yeah. noise. So what's unfortunate is I have two spares at home sitting in my garage. Oh, I thought you brought the spares. I didn't because I was like, I don't really have room and I'm yeah. not I'm not gonna break a thirty five spine axle shaft. So out here. it means we need a you need to cut off the old one. You need to get a new bearing kit and I then need, press need, it on. I need to Yes, they're gonna have them at O'Reilly's. They're super common, the bearing kits. Yeah. And they're cheap. You just need to find something. I need to find some with a press. So I got myself set up here at his and hers automotive in Elko, Nevada. 
down the street, I was able to find in stock the wheel bearing sets that I need. I'm just gonna do replace both sides. Uh, they hooked me up with a jack stand, obviously a place to work and a drain pan. And I got my tools out and we we're gonna be here for a little while trying to fix this. I'm not sure if you guys are gonna be able to see or hear this, but this is the problem we're having. So this whole wheel bearing is bad and loose and the whole thing is moving and you can hear the grinding, the clicking of that bearing and that's not good. You don't want to lose that on the trail. I got a hold of Kelly. He, uh, he found that his and hers automotive place or whatever you guys had called it, um, they're being super helpful. They're actually pressing one of the bearings on as we speak and he's disassembling the other side. So. He's in good shape. He's got the parts, he's got the tools. Now he's just got to finish buttoning everything up and he'll be on his way to come see us. That was, that's super fast. It's like, what, 10.30? So he got that all all done that quickly. That's awesome. So with the wheel off, I think you'll be able to see it a little bit better. This is the first time I've ever left a man behind, but in this case, it's kind of special. Kelly is a very proficient mechanic. I wasn't worried about him not being able to get this done. And the Set 20 is super common for the Ford 9 inch. It's, it's over the counter at like any parts store in the United States. That said, we also have a just ridiculous deadline. We have a ton of miles to cover this week. We'd like to make it to the Arizona border. So we all determined, Kelly included, we all decided that it would be best for us to continue on while Kelly took care of this, and then he would just meet us further down the trail. We have Starlink, he'll have service coming out of Elko, so we'll be able to determine a place that'll work for us to meet. I just, I have this prediction. So we have multiple cheeses and multiple meats. Let's snow, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know? How are we gonna do this without the snow tent? <laughs> Watch, <laughs> Kelly comes over the top at us. Right. What's taking snow? you guys so long? Right, oh. Snow tent set up for camp. Might be snow pressure time, guys. This truck is entirely not prepped for a true off-road trip the way we've done it. It is on 37s, but this is a stock Raptor. Saying that a stock Ford Raptor on 37s is likely too heavy for a long range snow trip would probably be not a controversial statement at all unless you watched the Chevy Suburban that's 10,000 pounds right behind it. But the difference is one has bead locks and the other one doesn't. And this just comes down to what kind of tire you're using, how does it perform in the snow, how big of a contact patch can you give yourself even though you're 10,000 pounds. And I think that there's no better example of how important your tire is on the terrain than rocks and snow. This is kind of right a big snow port. test. We're seeing how bad the spring snow is. This is real slushy. And I'm right. testing tires that, they're mud terrains, but in theory, I feel like these could work really well in the snow. So this is a really deep little berm. I'm down to like six PSI. I usually go lower, but it's a brand new set of tires. I'm starting a little bit higher. I'll work my way down. As you can see, I'm using technology to try to get up this snow, and I'm playing around with it. The snow changes a lot from state to state and from day to day and different times of the year and everything else. So instead of just like hitting it full bore, I wanna to try to crawl it and see how the snow feels, see if I need to lower my air pressure and whatnot. And my trash control system is doing the bulk of the heavy lifting right now. <laughs> it's doing what it's supposed to do. <laughs> These Nitto mud grapplers are super wide, which is giving me a lot of flotation, but being able to use the multi-terrain select function is giving me that extra advantage of being able to uh, just slowly creep up this and let the brake system figure out where I'm losing traction and compensating.
now that we've gotten a taste for the type of snow we're going to be dealing with, um, I can do this with my electronic assistants and gizmos and crawl things slow, but man, it is not going to get us anywhere in a hurry. We really just need to try and float on top of this, try to make as much distance as possible in a short amount of time. And unfortunately, this is an extremely long section. We're going to be burning through fuel really quickly at this rate. I saw that. I wonder. probably got everything you need. Do you want me to go forward and try to figure out a way to meet Kelly on the other side of this fence that he's stuck behind? Yes, boogie on. We'll take care of this. We are boogieing. It just keeps getting deeper. This is crazy. Wow, I can like feel the, the rocks moving under my feet. Let me see that guy. Look at this. This is deep, dude. <laughs> Holy cow. Now that the adrenaline-fueled high horsepower vibes are over, it's, it's feeling so remote out here. You really get a grasp of just how big and how remote Nevada really is. So the next thing on the priority list, of course, is to make contact with Kelly, which we did. Yes, I can hear you. And then get the group back together. So once Kelly and I meet up and we uh, catch up for a few minutes, talk about his rig, I tell him what had happened during, throughout the day, we all get together, we find camp, and we need to take care of the next concern on this priority list. I'm concerned about fuel. I've got four and a half gallons here, and five gallons here, and I already need them. So, I mean, it makes sense to like use it as you go, right? I shouldn't wait till I get empty to put it in there, but I have plenty of space in this tank already, which is unfortunate, and I'm gonna fill it with fuel. We just ripped through 86 miles of a 219 mile section, meaning that it's 219 miles between fuel ups. 
I am so glad that I brought 9 or 10 extra gallons because normally I don't bring spare fuel, but Nevada just seemed like if, <laughs> if you're going to bring spare fuel every, anywhere, this should be the place to do it. And I'm really feeling the remoteness. I just cannot even express what it feels like to be so far in the middle of nowhere. Especially United States, you know, there's only a few chunks of this country left where you can really feel this remote. Speaking of which, I'm sure Chris can feel the remote nature of what we're dealing with, considering that he is down a spare tire. So we're going to do the first of many tri tire repairs on this trip. Well, I can use that right there. So you just kind of like hold it in as you tighten it. Yep. You don't have to get it like crazy tight. It just has to seal. All right, we are ready to rock and roll. I'm looking at this road and I'm wondering if the cows just use the road as their bathroom and then they use everything else for eating. That's not cow, that's uh, more like a horse. All right, same statement, but with horses. Well, I mean, it's definitely not a bullshit theory. Pretty cool to be doing the old Pony Express route. This is something, you know, I, I learned about it junior high or elementary school, I can't remember which, but we're driving on the routes they used to deliver mail to the West Coast on. So you're telling me that Kevin Costner rode a horse this whole trail just to deliver a letter? He's a man capable of many things. So you're telling me Kevin Costner has gills behind his ears? Yeah, he was the, yeah, the aquatic postman. Yeah, don't you guys remember that 90s movie, The Aquatic Postman? I'm pretty sure I'm not mixing up my movies. I'm pretty sure I saw that one. When the Exxon Valdez crashed, in, crashed into the afterworld, or post-apocalyptic whatever, Kevin Costner has a lot of post-apocalyptic stuff on his resume, doesn't he? I mean, Bull Durham? <laughs> I did not know about this film, but it's now in my mental catalog of things I should watch, and also things I shouldn't watch. Well, Bull Durham, everybody should watch because Susan Sarandon has cleavage like the Holland Tunnel. That was one of my mom's favorite movies. And my mom's favorite tunnel. We are at 6,800 and as I'm watching the elevation just climb like by the second. We're going up. We're going up quick. When planning this trip initially, we thought that this was going to be like a crazy snow climb, in which it ended up not being. It ended up just being a beautiful day. But whenever we crest to the top, we got our first glimpse of something that ended up being a huge highlight of this trip for us. so cool to rip across the lake bed, have lunch, and then head out. I mean, I wish we could have spent a little more time here because it was just a, a really cool highlight of the trip, but we were in a hurry. We were running out of fuel, all the things you've already heard us talk about. And unfortunately, because of us being in a hurry, Kelly got a little bit misplaced, we'll say, and I had to recover him. And then we were back on the road and hoping to make it to Austin before we ran out of fuel. And if we can get there early enough, we're hoping that we can have dinner at a restaurant, have someone else do the dishes, and perhaps not cut a steak on our lap. All right, we're back on the real trail. This detour was brought to you by Distracted Driving. Distracted Driving, killing people since 1929. I'm not a count your chickens before they hatch kind of person, but I think we might have dodged our brutal day of snow.
last little section was gooey. We're three and a half miles from town. And we gotta air down because this last stretch is really messed up. As I started to take the truck up, I mean, I had the lowest tire pressure I've ever run, like four pounds. So we had great footprint, had all the, I had everything that I thought that I knew. But part of the arrogance of off-roading is thinking that you can take something that is 9,500 pounds up a particular part of the trail. And look, the, like they said earlier, the snow was terrible. It was all melting and creating a very soft mush. And this truck is just gonna find its way off the trail into that soft mush. Hey buddy, we're coming to recover you. Don't get, uh, don't get too crazy up there. Same thing, and I'm leaned over about as much as I want. If you watched our Washington trip where we did the backcountry discovery route, you would have seen David in a very dangerous situation up there as well. And this is way worse. I, the reality is this is a ton of truck. In fact, it's like five tons of truck. And he needs an anchor point. And what was nice about Washington and Oregon is that there's anchor points everywhere because of the uh, because of all the trees. Here, I am the anchor point. So now I need to get in front of him we need to use me as an anchor point so we can try to put some weight on that front corner and then he can work the winch and try to drive out. Well guys, I got bad news. I think we're going back to town the other way because I am I can definitely slowly work my way through this, but once we get up up there past this turn, it gets, it's just too dangerous. Because it does, right now, I'm, I feel safe because there's dirt next to me, but up there there's none. It's all the way, snow all the way to the bottom. Hey look, uh, Before I address my problems, I want to get David out of harm's way. So we're going to use the winch connected to me and then David's ability to drive to just like in combination, get him off the side of this hill. But unfortunately, another problem has arisen. Bourbon will not start. And if you remember, we're at the end of a 212 mile long leg of this trip, and we're in the last three miles of it. Um, David is not out of fuel, but David is low enough on fuel that being sat in this position for long enough, it uh, in introduced air into the system. So now everything has changed again. What we're gonna do is, it's gonna be all hands on deck to try and figure out how to get my wheel, or my tire back on the wheel rather, and David's co-pilot, also named David, is going to prime the system for that old diesel to purge all the air. So hopefully things will time out to where he can get that thing started while at the same time I have four tires again on the ground instead of just three. Jack this up and fix this tire. And then, uh, I think I have soap in there. I need soap and water, obviously. Bottle oh, Jack City. Bottle Jack City population. Me. You. With a combination of two bottle jacks on big heavy duty rocks and uh, some digging, we were able to clean out the bead as much as we could with soap and water and then reseat this tire. At least seat it as much as we could. It, you could tell that it did. It wasn't fully seated, but it was holding air, and it was enough for us to at least deal with David, who now, after holding his brake for an hour, has a truck that starts.
I didn't want him to winch to me without him being able to drive. And now that I have four tires on the ground instead of three, he has the ability to drive. I think that we can safely get him off of this hill. We want to do this in one shot. We don't want to try to do it a few different times. And so for that reason, we have multiple winches. We have multiple people spotting and things are slowly starting to come out of this. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go anywhere and come back home, go together. You're on. What a way to end in day three. Well, not even end. <laughs> Just work our way through day three. It is seven o'clock. We got to safely back down this and then go find camp somewhere and everyone's low on fuel and food. We'll see what happens. <laughs> We're basically passing right back where uh, I slid off in the first place. That's where it's got the most angle. And we're a few degrees, we're a 20 degree tilt. I was at a little over 30 earlier. And, uh, you know, learning anything through this, it's when you can't maintain and the back end keeps sliding, stop. Should have never gone up this hill. But when you're when you're with friends, you feel like you can do anything. And in most cases, we can. But this is one of those where uh, you should have turned around and uh, taken the alternate route. With a little bit of finagling, we were able to get turned around and headed to Austin, Nevada. We were already pretty beat before this, and now we are absolutely exhausted. We walked into a, a restaurant that was a restaurant slash bar. The restaurant section was already closed down. But uh, when the owner saw a group of hungry dudes, they opened up for us and we got a real meal in a real restaurant. We got to wash our hands <laughs> and our faces and stuff. And then we found a quick and dirty camp right outside of town. <coughs> Good morning and welcome to day four. Day three, we went pretty hard. We got here real late last night. This is a very quick and dirty camp. We just used Onyx to find a place right outside of town that was not private land. And uh, we set up <laughs> ducks in a row. We just needed to get to sleep. But now the sun's coming up. It is absolutely gorgeous out here, but uh, I think it's going to be a slow morning. We need to lick our wounds. And today, I believe we break 9,000 feet, if I remember correctly. Does everybody have radios on this morning? Copy. Yes. 10 4 from the Tacoma. Looks like we got everybody. Day, day 4, 9.43, now Jake can show you his Geos. Subject, yeah, subject, Dave. <laughs> Today we are going to try to get as close as we can to 9,000 feet. Kingston Summit is 86.74. We don't, you know, the snow has been different pass to pass, so we don't know exactly what the conditions are up there until we put tires on it. We know there's going to be some snow but we don't know exactly how bad it's gonna be. And learning lessons from yesterday is we are obviously not gonna lead with the heaviest vehicle. Um, I don't know why we were doing that whenever we did it. So now we're gonna lead with Kelly. Kelly has got the 39 inch KO2s. Those are our favorite snow tire. And he's gonna be aired down to like three or two. And if he can't make it, then there's no point in trying to yard a bourbon up and over. However, if Kelly can manage a way to weave up and over the top of this with me behind him, then with some basic recovery tactics, I do think that we can drag the heavier full-size rigs behind us. You sure did, dude. You sure did. Can you back, can you, if you put it in R, does it go anywhere? Right there. 
the water. Okay. That's a. That Kelly's hole is about 0.5 nicks high. This far. So don't tow your trailer past that point. That's what that sign says? Yeah. <laughs> That's like, interesting. Well, I'm glad I didn't bring it. Okay, pro tip. Pro tip. <laughs> pro tip, yeah. <laughs> this is absolutely beautiful up here, though. It's like a national park. This would. This is lunch. If we could we can. I like your attitude. This snow is already better than yesterday, which makes me very happy. Now, I don't know what lies beyond. I don't know if there's going to be any of the same kind of off camber sketchy stuff that we saw yesterday, but we're at least going to navigate our way through this little section with the like underground river. And uh, Kelly and I will branch off, just the two of us, see how far ahead we can get because we're not very far from the top. If we can get to the top, then we'll definitely come back down and we'll serve as anchor points. We can double anchor point the other two up to the top with winching. And then, you know, I mean, gravity could be scary, but going down the other side, shouldn't be as bad in theory. It's not deep, it's just real flickering. People have said that, said that out loud. I'm sorry, Mother Nature. That, that, that's how you make things deep. <laughs> Uh, some sort of uh, super old mining equipment mounted up on that hill. Oh, yeah, to the left. I was about to ask, where? Uh, the one that's like 50 feet from my face. Yeah, it looks like the bottom of like uh, something that they would use to drop stuff from the top of the hill on the right down to the bottom here. No, nothing about mining, so I'm just gonna say mine shaft a bunch. But yeah, you're right, Kelly, mine shaft. We are not far from the top, which is great news. We're, we're making really good time. We're just air down super low. We're being really nice and calm, cautious, positive, good vibes. But unfortunately, Nevada snow is not done with us yet. snow here is so slushy and so off camber that it makes it very difficult and very dangerous no matter what tire no matter what tire you have <laughs> so even with you know the snow stickies and air down to four it doesn't matter you're just gonna slide because uh, just the way the snow is sometimes you you just can't it doesn't go the way you expect it to go and uh, we, we lived that the yeah, not expect we, it yeah we lived that a couple days ago we were out there for four hours recovering each other. Well, yeah, we got traction boards. Oh, lost it. Well, our problems have compounded. I don't exactly know why this is not seating, this bead, but when we aired it up to like 30 or 40 before, we couldn't get it to seat. It, you could physically see some sort of a weird gap between the wheel and the tire. It just was not wanting to seat. In any case, this is where a lot of people get frustrated and start getting mad at each other, but Kelly and I have been through thick and thin together, and this is just, this is par for the course when him and I leave pavement. The way I, the way I communicate with Kelly, it mirrors directly the way I communicate with my brother. Our friendship yeah. has, has devolved into like bickering that's not serious. <laughs> it might sound serious to an outside person. We just take yeah. each other down a peg as soon as yeah. it's like off, over and, and over just, and over. Yeah. Okay. In theory, you know what I mean? It's an interesting story. I was going to say it would just, you know, flip the bitch right there and like the back would go down and be all fine. But when I gas it, it would just slide right off. Do you think that you're Dominic Toretto from Fast and Furious, Kelly? Is that what's going on here? Yes, I watched too many Fast and Furious in the last couple of weeks. You live your life a quarter inch of snow at a time? Yeah. And for those few inches, you're free? It's it's like it's in a separate game, you know? You're out here to have fun and uh, and go off road, but you can add a layer to it if you just are belittling the people that you value in your life. I like how you look at your situation, you're like, dude, if I just went backwards, really fast <laughs> and whip the wheel like I'm Vin Diesel. It might work. Or I might roll off the cliff, you know, I don't know. It's a 50-50 shot. Know. <laughs> it's a 50, straight 50-50, dude. 
<laughs> Those are way better odds than I was thinking. At a time. <laughs> yeah, we exactly. made a couple of wrong decisions in a row here. And uh, yeah, we did, Kelly. I don't know what you're talking You about. got stuck first. That's true. I did get stuck first. I'll, I'll give you that. For whatever reason, we still can't get this tire to seat, and it sucks, and it's frustrating, and anything below 10 PSI, you can audibly hear air coming out of this tire. But as soon as you go over that, no, no more of a problem. And then, of course, if you go above, much above 10 PSI, it's like trying to drive through the snow with a rock. It just sinks. It doesn't float at all. So we're trying to play this fine line where we're like at 10 to 12 because we don't hear it leaking. <laughs> but... It's also still a little, it's a little too hard, but we're just, the tire keeps coming off the bead. We keep trying to like pump it up. Anytime we go above that threshold, it's so hard. It literally just sinks. Like it's, it's almost worthless having it. But after getting my Tacoma turned around, we were able to dig a path. We were able to stay on that path with uh, the use of traction boards and whatnot, while of course, topping the tire off throughout this process. And then we were able to get me in a position where I could easily and safely retrieve Kelly and then we can tuck tail and head back to David and Chris. Recovering him was, again, like David, we could have recovered him fairly quickly yesterday. If my tire didn't come off the beat, same thing happened up there. The next time we aired up, I was determined to sit this beat and at 59 PSI, we heard a giant pop and it went right in. It just... For whatever reason, this tire did not seat. I think that whenever I took these tires in to get swapped onto these wheels, I bet that they didn't get it to seat all the way either. They just thought it did. And so I've been fighting it this whole time when it just had never been seated from the get-go. But now, with it seated, I've got lots of confidence moving forward that we're not gonna have to deal with this problem anymore because these bead grips are unbelievably good at holding onto the bead, but your tire has to make that connection and that was the problem is part of the tire was like rolled over and it wasn't snapping into place forming a good seal aside from that the recoveries were not over yet we went to some like weird lake bed that was just a strange white powder along the whole bottom not like salt like something else and i had fallen through a crust and encountered mud like i've never seen oh oh dude wow that is nuts man it's like a, this is nuts. The second we stopped, it was over. I don't think that airing down is even gonna make a difference. We're going to, but like by the looks of that, I'm not sure that airing down is what we need. I think that we need to, somebody to help get us going. <laughs> I've never seen mud like this. I mean, I can step right here and I'm fine. But then you get to some, it just, Wow. Well, we, we do these these kinds of things for experiences and this is a new one for me. night this was the sunset absolutely gorgeous the mountains are stunning this is this is Nevada this is an amazing amazing place way more mountains than I would have thought by just being someone who's driven through a bunch of times and you know weird salty brine mud situation aside this is just such a perfect evening and though we do have one more mountain pass to try and tackle um, I feel like the worst is behind us. I just have a good feeling about the next couple of days and I really look forward to just like airing down with a tire that'll hopefully stay on the wheel now and just making a ton of miles, having some fun with friends and slowly but surely navigating our way to the Arizona border. We're good with another one. Good morning guys. Good morning. I can't believe it's day five. These trips always go by so fast. We're halfway through the trip and we are, I don't think we're halfway through the map. I haven't really had time. Well, I guess I have. I was hanging out with my friends and having fun last night instead of looking at the map. I should probably see how much we have left before we like end this thing to figure out what kinds of pace. I mean, the good news is 
We've got one really big peak today, and then I think it's gonna be fairly flat from there, and we're just gonna be mobbing. But, you know, time management is always tough on these trips, and I'm sure we're gonna have to make some decisions in order to make sure that we can get to Arizona by day 10. Clearly need more cheese. So the, the shower is potentially in Tonopah? Yes. And we are potentially there today. Oh, Tonopah. All right, so we are currently 137 trail miles on the BDR from Tonopah. Okay. About 18 miles in front of us is our highest peak, 87.41. Woo! Um, yeah. I do I, see snow around us too. Oh, when I cross-referenced that with the U.S. Forestry Service snow map, that is the, it's the same color as everything that we tried to go through yesterday. Well, so it's another, it's an another attempt. However, I can say and on the side of optimism, when we tried, we were thinking the Overland Pass for sure was going to be just a snowy mess. And it was, I mean, dry. it was yeah. an absolute cakewalk. So it's not really that predictable, right? Just based on elevation. So maybe we'll get lucky. It's, I wouldn't say it's predictable. What I would say is that if it is impassable, our our day is going to be a lot of highway miles because there is no go around yeah. this mountain range. Kelly, catch up! Mom! Mom! The conditions are absolutely perfect today, and it is a great day to try to make a ton of miles, which is what we plan on doing. We are going to rip through miles. And as far as views are concerned, this might be my favorite part of the Nevada backcountry discovery route. The views are unbelievable out here, and we're still at such crazy high altitudes if you're coming from a place like Washington or Texas. Oh yeah, look at that snow. All right, all in favor of bypassing the impossible snow, say aye. 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 It gets real rough up there. <laughs> I like, can imagine. We can see when I, I say rough, over. it is definitely, I don't like the word impassable, but it is not passable. Well, we can see the big one. Is it even bigger than that? Oh, uh, yeah. And it just like, it goes, like it zigs and zags. And If we were like two or three weeks later, this would have been totally doable. But timing is hard to nail whenever you're like picking out dates a year in advance. The Nevada BDR trip versus the other two is, uh, it's a little bit earlier. Our, our, we keep getting, all, they'll keep getting busier, so it works out better to do it earlier. And we like to have a more challenging trip. We attempt to execute a plan B that we had found on Onyx, and it goes up and over, and it would have been beautiful to be able to go up and over this, but we decided to not even put tires on it. Once we got up there and we got to see the snow that was on the road, and you got to see the just off camber, <laughs> If it was day one, we would have definitely fought the good fight, but on day five, we are prioritizing a midweek shower over fighting the good fight. So we're turning around, we're hitting the highway, and this is where we really start to make up miles, which feels incredible. It feels really good to have a fast pace. It feels really good to feel like you're somewhere near civilization. And after checking out a little ghost town and going over a couple more dirt roads, boom, we're having a shower and then we're headed to camp. Unfortunately, my friend here took a stick to the sidewall. So we are going to, I, I have a lot of options, believe it or not. This is one. We could, this, the easiest, if it's just a stick. These are the expandos. Okay, do we go up from there? Yeah. yeah. But these are crazy sticky. I think that it's made on it. Yeah. There it is. Look at you! <laughs> My gosh, this is like a full service tire shop here. This thing's terrifying. It's a non locking. Like. Don't do that near my face, I'm terrified. I was doing it above your head. <laughs> I know, I'm just kidding. Smells like dude in there. <laughs> He's on one. <laughs> it's so high up there. I mean, I'm about six one. Do you want a can of oxygen? 
yeah. before you crawl up in there. <laughs> Holy cow. You're definitely away from the bears and the animals and stuff. <laughs> we call it the tree house. It is definitely a tree house. What? Joshua trees really fascinate me and interest me. They're so bizarre compared to where I live. So camping amongst the Joshua trees was a real treat. And now you can really feel that we're on the backside of this trip instead of the front side. And I have a feeling that we're going to start making so many miles so quickly that we're even going to be able to end this trip a little bit early, which honestly, I don't think anyone's going to be bummed out about. It's great that we have a shower and that definitely changes everyone's outlook on life. But once we put a bow on this thing, we do each have like a couple day trip home. So I think that uh, it's time to coast, you know, you can't go so hard for so many days in a row. You really need to have some time to just make miles, listen to good music, hang out with your friends, give each other a hard time. And hopefully, if you're lucky, run into a surprise mystery sand dune. Uh, S dime has enough horse pressures to uh, successfully do any sand dune type stuff. You're gonna have to. You're gonna have to demonstrate that. I'm afraid. From the speed ten to the snow ten, and now you will be the sand ten. I am a dune noob, but I am here to have fun. That probably doesn't help at all. That <laughs> doesn't help at all. <laughs> now we'll see if we can do some, some burnies here. Oh yeah. How's that look? Did we hit it? Yeah, baby. Yeah. That was a goodie. Aircraft battery level low. That's a real brody, brody right there. Whipping shitties. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> All right, all right. I'm sure I'm getting, yeah. getting mini fluids nice and hot. We'll go back to four wheel drive and we'll, we'll, we'll treat this to come with the respect it deserves. This surprise dune trip was exactly what we needed. What a great way to end this whole trip. I mean, we basically were on our last night here, which our last night was originally going to be Las Vegas, but we just decided let's get some steaks let's go camp on our last night let's have some fun and we'll, we'll just party at our own little we're camp we're not gonna have to worry about our vehicles getting stolen or any of that stuff we're just gonna eat well we're gonna laugh big we're gonna drink we're gonna have a really good time to celebrate crossing the finish line into arizona tomorrow Welcome to Arizona. We made it to a bunch of trash <laughs> but we're across the border. What an adventure. The next one is going to be a lot different. We have been planning, I think the when we decide to come down here and uh, make our way to Mexico, we will probably be uh, bringing in a whole lot of rocky trails, which is going to be awesome. Huge thanks to everybody for coming. Thank you. Yeah, great time. Thanks. Awesome time. Jake, get up here. Huge thanks to Jake for allowing this to happen. He is our Power Stop representative, and he does a great job. Thanks, Nick. You guys do a great <laughs> job. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. We'll see you on the next one. Support the companies that support this channel. Power Stop Brake and Onyx Off-Road are fully responsible for this trip taking place and for us being able to take 
all of the time that it takes to plan these trips, to film these trips, and the many, many, many months of editing that it takes to go through all the footage and make these videos possible. So huge thanks to Onyx Off-Road and Power Stop Break. This kind of stuff simply cannot get made without you.